So, yeah, thank you for the, for the lovely introduction. I'll just dim this slightly so you don't have to look quite so much at me and a little bit more at what's on the slides. Um, so, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to talk to you. A little bit strange to be on this side of the lecture theatre. And, um, uh, yeah, and it, it's a, a, a real pleasure. So I'm hoping today to give you a little bit of a, a flavour as to how we can uh, link physics with medicine and, uh, and improve uh, cancer diagnosis using MRI. Um, so you've already had a little bit of a, a start, uh, a little bit of an introduction, but I'll, I'll take you back right to the start. So it started here for me about 25 years ago with uh, this young man here, who's my brother Matt, sitting over there in the audience. Um, Matt always loved physics, and he, he always loved about learning about how things worked and how to, how to break things, more importantly, and then uh, how to put things back together, hopefully. Um, and so with Matt, he always knew he wanted to do physics, and he was a really big influence for me as to why I kind of got into physics and how I, I found it interesting. But for me, things were a little bit more complicated than that, and I kind of enjoyed the biology and I liked the chemistry as well, but Matt said he wouldn't give me any credit unless I did a degree that had general relativity in it, so I had little choice. <laughs> So, um, so I went to college and, uh, and I studied chemistry and physics and also uh, maths and biology. Um, my my uh, physics teacher is here uh, from, from college, it's great to see him here, and, uh, and I had a, had a really good time there. I actually found physics and maths to be the most challenging of my uh, A-level subjects and um, persevered with them and I, I always found them very interesting, but still uh, I did find it kind of a little bit daunting at times. But uh, during my AS, uh, between the summer uh, of AS and A2, I, I had a, a knuckle bursary here at Sussex where I worked with uh, Ben Varco. And I was designing some microwave cavities for use in a, a quantum computing experiment. Um, this gave me my first kind of taste of what, what research was like. And I, I really enjoyed um, doing that and kind of was really, really excited then when Sussex invented this new degree, which was physics with a research placement. Now, anyone here that's kind of still looking to, to go to uni, if you're interested at all in doing research, then I say look up this research placement degree because it's really, really, really good and gives you a good taste as to what doing research is like. Um, so, yeah, so I, I was really excited to come to Sussex and I uh, had the pleasure of meeting this young man who's also in the audience back there, um, Pete Hurley. So... This is me and Pete in the third year MPhys lab, um, and Pete was a massive influence on me as well during my undergrad. He showed me what true persistence meant when he explained to me over and over and over again what, what, my, uh, what my problem sheets were asking me to do. Um, so I've got a lot to thank for, for that. Um, and I, yeah, I really enjoyed my time here at Sussex, and I think uh, that was a big part. Um, so for the research placement... Uh, I spent a lot of the, the summers with Mike Hardiman in, in his lab, who were uh, aiming to improve the sensitivity of the neutron, uh, measuring the neutron's electric dipole moment. And in the lab, uh, this was, so I was working here with Katerina and Andrew, who's over there, and I told him I would put an embarrassing picture if he didn't show up, so it's good to see him here. <laughs> So in the lab, I, I got my first taste of what um, magnetism was about and, and low temperature physics. And this was uh, a really interesting subject for me to do. I also learned how to make the best cup of tea, uh, which Mike is adamant that didn't happen because he says he's never seen me make a cup of tea. But um, trust me, it was, it was definitely one of the most important findings of my time. Uh, one of the highlights of the research placement was going to the ILL um, and seeing the main experiment in the flesh. So Part of my, um, my project work was to, to make small scale model designs of this experiment and to test their properties. So having the chance to go to the main experiment was really nice and um, it, was, it was an exciting thing to, to be able to see. So when I was coming to the end of my time here at Sussex, uh, I, I had to make a choice of what to do next and having really enjoyed all the research placement uh, projects, I knew I wanted to get into, uh, into research and, and doing a PhD would be the most logical step for that, but one thing that I wanted was a little bit more, um, a little bit more kind of applied physics. I wanted to, to have something that affected people a bit more. So I started looking into medical physics um, PhDs, and I found this one at the uh, the Institute of Cancer Research. And um, the the degree at Sussex doesn't have that much medical physics in it. So I was going into the 
interviews with not, not that much medical physics background, but a lot of research experience from the research placement. And that was one of the main things that set me aside in the, in the interviews for, for the uh, degree, uh, for the PhD. And I think, again, it, not to ram home how good the research placement degree is too much, but I would say it's a really good thing to be doing if you have the, have the option. So this brings me on to what I want to talk about today. So the main, uh, the main subject area is magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and I want to tell you, first of all, how that's used in cancer diagnosis and, and in determining cancer treatment, but also how we're improving that now and how my PhD has kind of helped to build, on, to build on that. So those of you that are unfamiliar with an MRI scanner, it's a big, big magnet here, a big donut-shaped magnet, and inside there is a load of liquid helium. So it's cold, it's superconducting, and it's really, really strong. So just how strong is this MRI magnet? So just to put it into perspective, we've got the Earth's magnetic field, about 50 microtesla. And we've got a scrapyard magnet here. So these things pick up cars and big chunks of metal. And they're, they're around about 1.5 tesla, which is 30,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. Whereas the uh, clinical MRI magnets we use go all the way up to 7 tesla, which is 140,000 times stronger than the Earth's field. So we've got some really, really strong magnets here. And the reason we need these strong magnets is to get these nice images. So I don't know if you want to play Guess Who, but these are some MRI images of, of myself. So we've got um, a brain, which, which is probably an important thing for me to point out, and point out to you. Um, but one of the really nice things about MRI images is you can see this nice tissue contrast. So here you can see a bit of a kidney. I've got weird kidneys, so you can only see one of them, but there is another one in there, I promise. Um, you've got a, a liver here. You can see the spine and, and the bones. So one of the reasons why MRI is so good at, at um, cancer diagnosis is you can see the difference between these, these tissues. And I'll show you a little more of the images later on. But first of all, how do we actually get this MRI signal? So MRI is, is essentially looking at where the water is in your body. So we're really lucky in that there's about 70% of our bodies are made of water. So that means we've got access to loads and loads of signal. And the, as I said a minute ago, the contrast is, is different in different tissues. So that's why um, MRI is really good for diagnosing uh, problems for cancer. Um, but in particular, we're, we're actually interested in looking at the hydrogen when we're looking at uh, MRI images. And not just going right into the, the atom now. So here we've got the hydrogen atom. And we're particularly interested in the proton, in the, which is the nucleus of the, of the uh, hydrogen. Now, the nucleus has this property called spin. Now, I don't want to label what spin really is, but I'm just going to call it spin for now, and it's a really important property in MRI. So we want to play with this spin. So if I were to take a box of water, which is here, I've got all these spins, and, and at room temperature, uh, with no magnetic field, these spins are just randomly distributed around. They're just sort of doing what they like. But then if we were to turn on a magnetic field, like this, the spins will either align with the field or against the field. So we've got a magnetic, oops, sorry, a magnetic field here. The spins are either aligned with or against it. Now, with this alignment, there is an energy associated uh, with the with the spins. So the spins that are aligned against the magnetic field have a higher energy than the spins that are aligned with the magnetic field. Now, this is the the crux of how MRI works. So. Getting, uh, if you want to get a signal, we're interested in the difference in the number of spins that are aligned with the field and the number of spins that are aligned against the field. So here we've got seven on the bottom, six on the top. You find the difference between the two of them. And this is the kind of maths I enjoy. So you've got a difference of, a difference of one. Um, so this would mean you've got a signal here because there's a difference in the number of spins up versus down. In reality, uh, the maths is a little, bit, a little bit harder than that. I don't have like, this many fingers. But um, here, we, here I'll just introduce this term polarization. So the polarization is the difference in the number of spins up and down, what we just looked at. And in reality, we have actually a five in every million difference. So this is for water protons at room temperature. Um, so that means if I were to draw all of those spins out. I don't really want to draw a million, but so if you imagine this being a million spins 
on the top, we've got a million and five spins on the bottom, so there's a difference of five in every million there. So this is actually quite a weak signal. Now, if you um, this this equation here is is important to so the magnetization. Now, the magnetization is actually what this is the signal strength, and you can see that if you increase the polarization, you increase your signal strength. But as I've just said, at room temperature uh, for protons, it's very, very small number, so a very weak signal. And this is why MRI can take quite a long time uh, to acquire the, the picture, to make your picture. But we're lucky because at room temperature, uh, sorry, in the body, we've got so many protons, we actually have a, a big N here. So N is the number of spins, num uh, so the number of spins in your body of, of water. This is great. Um, so we're actually able to get some good pictures to help us with cancer diagnosis. So that's enough of the first kind of physics part. I'll show you some pictures now if we can all, all have a look. So here you can see some pictures of people with, with cancer. So here's a brain um, and a very obvious brain tumour here. And you've got a, some, a breast tumour here. And this one is a prostate. So the contrast is actually different here, but you can see the tumour here outlined with the arrows. So as you can see, MRI is really, really good at, at pointing out these, these cancers to us. So why is it that, uh, why is it that I'm, I'm here telling you that I want to improve the technique? You know, it's already pretty, it's already pretty good. But the answer to that lies in the cases where you have something a bit more complicated going on. So have a look here. As a, so this is a cross-section through the middle of a person. You can see here, he's not got weird kidneys. He's got two. Um, and you can see the spine here. So this big lump up here is a, is a tumour. And that was before treatment. And this chap was given some, some therapy and he went away. He came back for his post-treatment scan and you see the tumour's got a lot bigger. Now from the imaging alone you say, this is bad news, we need to give him another treatment, we need to do something. Fortunately for this guy, he had another scan which was called an FDG-PET scan. So in FDG-PET you take a radio-labeled uh, sugar, so it's a radioactive sugar, and uh, you, that is injected into the body. Now the cancer is really, really hungry and it wants to take in this sugar. And in this image, black is bad. Black means lots of this radio-labeled sugar is stuck there. So before treatment, loads and loads and loads of sugar stuck in this, in this tumour. But after treatment, it's gone. So in this case, this person has responded to treatment, but it hasn't shown up in the image just because of the type of drug we have used. And so it's, it's really important to point out that we need... Other, other modalities to look at what's going on uh, rather than just relying on imaging alone. So <coughs> there are some limitations with this. So the FDG PET scan, because it's radioactive, you wouldn't want to do that in children and you wouldn't want to do that very frequently in, in anyone because you, wouldn't, you don't want to have a, a exposure to that much radiation. So what I'm here to talk about today is how we can get information that's similar to that but without being dangerous and without... Uh, exposing anyone to anything hazardous. So we do that using a technique called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So MRS uh, works in exactly the same way that I described for MRI. We're still looking at the difference in population levels of the, of the up compared to the down spins. But instead of looking at where the water is distributed, we choose a little box here and we look to see what different chemicals are present. So the, the height of the peaks on this graph represent uh, the concentrations of different chemicals. And cancer looks very different to normal tissues, so you can characterize what kind of cancer it is and how aggressive it's likely to be and, and look for different properties. But the problem with looking at proton signals in, in the water is that you have this huge water signal there that's fantastic for us for imaging because that's exactly what we want to see there. But if you're interested in anything that's not water, then you're in trouble. You can see these tiny little blips down here, and it can be quite tricky to remove the water from your spectrum if you're, uh, if you're interested, especially if you're interested in something quite close to it. It can be a nightmare. So our solution is to look for something different. And we, we're interested in this uh, molecule, carbon-13. So there's tons of carbon in your body, but this is all predominantly, about 99% there, um, carbon-12. And... Carbon-12 is invisible in MRI, you can't see it. Whereas carbon-13 has this property of spin because it's got this extra neutron. 
And so we can see it using MRI or MRS. And the important thing is that it's not radioactive, so it's, it's not harmful. And the, the body will take in carbon-13 and use it in exactly the same way as it would use anything that contained carbon-12. So it's, it's used identically, and that means we can, uh, we can monitor things like metabolism, which I'll get onto in a minute. But there's always a downside, and the downside here is that uh, we have much uh, smaller signal strengths. It's only a quarter of the signal strength of proton, and there's not very much of it. But we can get around that by making carbon-13, so we synthesize it, and then we can inject it into the body and see where it goes. So cancer is really, really, really greedy, and it wants to eat this carbon-13 sugar. And that's great for us, because if we can inject in this carbon-13 sugar, we can watch what the cancer does with it. And any of you that have ever gone for a, a long run, the next day you come back and you're like, oh, my legs are really aching. That's because your body has, done, has undergone anaerobic respiration, it's, and it's generated lactic acid. So cancers do that all the time. That's their kind of base level of, of uh, metabolism. So they will take in sugar, and they'll turn it into lactic acid. And normal tissues don't do that and they don't do it that quickly. So cancers will stand out against normal tissues and you can actually see, see this metabolism happening. But we need enough signal to do that. So we come back to this equation, the magnetization equation, where <coughs> we know what our limiting factors are. So for carbon, we don't have very many spins. So this is, we're not looking good so far. We know that this um, gyromagnetic ratio is small, so this is where the, the quarter of the signal strength comes from. And the polarization, that's also really small because we're looking at a nucleus and there's not very big difference between the population of these spin states. So really that's it, you know, we should probably just go home and, you know, it was a nice idea, but, you know, unless, unless we can cheat. And this is what, what we do. And we cheat by uh, exploiting an electron. So electrons are fantastic. In, in here you can see the polarization against the temperature. So this is fairly well, warmish, and this is really, really cold. And in our experiment, we're around about here, about one Kelvin. If you look at what the electrons are doing at one Kelvin, they're pretty much 100% polarized. Whereas you look at the nuclei, they're still, you know, the, for the carbon, we're still down about 0.1%. So the electrons are doing pretty well at this point. And if you were to look at what their polarization was like on this uh, spin diagram, it would be something like this. You've got, you've got a huge potential signal here. But our problem at the moment is this is the polarization of the electron, and we want, we want it to be on the nucleus. We want to look at the carbon. So we need to steal this electron's polarization somehow so, and transfer it over to the carbon. And this is where dynamic nuclear polarization comes in. So this is the kind of crux of my thesis work using, using this technique. So the way that we do this is by taking a carbon-13 labeled sugar and we put it, in, uh, we put it into the sample cup um, and we mix it with some uh, free electrons. So this is where the, um, the stealing process begins, if you like. Um, and we take that sample and we put it down into really cold. So I said we were operating about one Kelvin. So um, here is me inserting a sample into our machine. So it's called the Hypersense. And the, the Hypersense has a magnet here, um, which is about three tesla. And it's also got a liquid helium bath. So when you put your sample in, you're, you're cooling it down to around about one Kelvin, which is where, where we want to be to get the high polarizations. So another warning, I'm going to try and explain some of the physics again now. So I've had a couple of pictures, but um, a little more physics. So when you have your carbons and your electrons mixed together, you get a lattice something like this when you freeze it. So you have quite a lot of nuclei and a couple of electrons dotted around. And then when you put this into a magnetic field, you get this energy level uh, diagram again. This is what we were looking at a minute ago. Um, so these, this would be for the, <coughs> the carbon-13 nucleus. And instead of saying uh, the lower ones are aligned with the field and the higher ones are aligned against, I've called them alpha and beta. Now, the black letters here are for the carbon, <laughs> and the energy gap here is separated by uh, a space which is characteristic for the carbon. When we introduce electrons, we get some extra energy levels. 
And these energy levels all have red letters. And so you've got the electrons uh, with a big gap between them and the nuclei with a little gap between them. And so this is, this is kind of how it looks uh, when you draw in these characteristic gaps. So now if we put on the, polar, the, uh, the spin populations that we saw earlier from this graph, we can see that um, at this temperature, the <coughs> nuclei have a very small difference in their population, but the electrons have a big difference in their population. And this is the way that, that this system wants to be. This is at equilibrium, it's happy. It doesn't want to change. And so, there we go. Big, big electron and small nuclear polarization. So now what we do is we play around with this population distribution by applying a microwave irradiation. And we do that at this frequency here. And when you do that, <coughs> match the populations of these two states. So now this one has gone down a bit, this one's gone up a bit. And all the time you're applying this microwave uh, irradiation, the state, these spins won't do anything. They're tied up, they're swapping between each other and they're not going to move anywhere. And all of a sudden this electron up here is really unhappy because in its, its partner state down here has just lost a load of spins. And this one is also unhappy because its partner state up here has just gained a load of spins. And that's not, that isn't how it wants to be. That's not the equilibrium. And so sneakily, we've tricked these electrons into uh, relaxing down into this energy state from up here. So when, you, when that happens, you end up with your, your uh, satisfying the equilibrium between these two, but you've been sneaky and you've actually made a really big population difference between the nuclear uh, energy levels, which is exactly what we want for uh, increasing our NMR signal. And so this is what it looks like on the machine. You can see time along the bottom and you can see your NMR signal on, up the top there. So over about an hour and a half, you can see your um, nuclear polarization building up just as we want. And this is fantastic. This is great. And just to show you how big an enhancement we actually get, Here's an example of a spectrum that I acquired with urea, and it took 65 hours. When we do this DMP enhancement, two seconds and a much, much bigger signal. And this is the equivalent uh, signal enhancement of taking a match and stretching it to the height of the Empire State Building. So we've got a really good signal enhancement here, and we're, we can play around with this now. So that's the hard bit done. And I promise that's most of the physics done too. Um, so what do we do? Once we've got the, um, the sample is cold at the moment, we've got this great polarization, but it's still cold, it's still frozen. And we want to dissolve this uh, and make it into a state where you can inject it into a person uh, and measure what happens. But it's tricky because once you dissolve this, the signal starts dying away, away really, really quickly. So you have to, you have to act fast. And uh, I'm sure from the title you can figure out now where the, the running in the corridor comes in. So the physics is done, and I've now got a reward for those who have managed to stay awake, which hopefully is a, a video of an experiment in action. So this is the, the screen of the hypersense. You can see the solvent uh, heating up there. That's the dissolution buffer heating up. When it gets to 10, that means it's action stations and everyone has to run like mad. Um, so once it reaches to 10, uh, the solvent will be shot down into the, uh, into the solid sample. It will dissolve it, and the liquid will come out here. So this is my supervisor, Tom, who's trying to not look too nervous. <laughs> um, and this, was, this is me, so I'm just speeding up a little here. You're going to see me take some of the sample out. Tom will check its pH, and then if I get the green light and it's all clear, then it's time to go. So there you go, it's coming out. Give it a little shake. So I've drawn up enough. Tom's checking the pH. He says it's good. And then we go. And we have to go not too far. We do have to go. <laughs> and then we're in. So that's the MRI magnet. And I'm going to do the injection. So if you were then to go to the control room and watch 
what, whoops, if you were going to go to the control room, hopefully, and watch what happened, oops, you would see this. So you've got a noise there, then bang, there's your pyruvate, this big peak here, so this is your sugar, and your cancer's making lactate. And you can see the, or lactic acid. So you can see it build up and then all die away. Notice it's sped up, so this would ordinarily happen over the course of about a minute or two minutes, depending on which magnet we were using. But then you see it's all gone. So we have, we have a short window of time where we actually get really, really nice data, <coughs> but then it does all die away quite quickly. So if I was to plot that out um, in a time series, you would see something like this. So you can see where we injected in the sugar, and then you can see the lactate building up and dying away. So at this point, I'll, I've sort of already slipped into science speak. If I say pyruvate, I mean sugar. And if I say <coughs> lactate, I mean lactic acid. It's, it's essentially the same thing. Um, so from this, we need to do something uh, which is, is quantifying the data. We need to make a way of saying, when we did this experiment, it had this much. And when we did this experiment, it had that much. And the way that we quantify it is by doing this kinetic modeling. Now, this is the most important parameter here, which is this K, K1 or K plus 1, which tells us the apparent rate of uh, pyruvate being turned into lactate. So when cancers are really aggressive, this will be really fast. And as cancers, if, if a, you give a treatment and it's worked, you would expect that rate to go down. Or for less aggressive cancers, you would expect it to be lower. And that's, so that's what we measure. And we measure that by doing this thing called kinetic modeling. So this is something that I spent a good couple of years of my PhD in optimizing. And uh, you can see here there's some quite complicated equations here that, um, that actually model the, the chemistry and the biology of the, of the reaction. Um, and, it, and you can see from the fits that they're, they're pretty nice and it, it works really well. Um, and we're happy with how it was, with how it, it's, uh, it's worked. And it allows you to actually get a number out for this. So if we look at some data, here you've got um, some cancer cells that we've treated. You can see here the lactate curves before and after treatment. And you can see that there is a massive difference in these two curves. And then when you do the kinetic modeling and you figure out what these K values are, you can see a really, really big drop. So it's, it's fairly obvious here that, the, um, that it's worked and that the treatment has worked. And so this is, the, uh, this is what we're hoping to take onto the clinic and to say, this is how we should analyze the data. And, th and this will give you an earlier marker of treatment response. And so I, I was very excited about this and, and put this, data, this uh, work in for a conference in Australia where I definitely didn't go on holiday at all and see kangaroos. So I was there happily um, showing off my data in, in uh, Australia and a, a chap comes along to my poster. So I'm explaining to him what we've done. And, um, and he seemed interested and he seemed like, you know, this was a really good idea. And then I got on to telling him about all this maths and about the kinetic modeling and his eyes kind of glazed over, and I sort of I thought, oh dear, this this guy's not a not a physicist. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. Actually, worse still, this guy was a clinician, and he was and he was the person I needed to explain this to. If this is gonna if this was gonna work, the clinician needed to know what I was talking about. So he he made it very clear he wasn't really interested in the maths, and he just kept looking at the at the graphs and saying, I oh, you know there's a change. And so we, he was staring at these graphs, and eventually we sort of said thanks very much and went away. But I was, I was kind of disheartened a little, because I thought, if this is going to work in the clinic, I need to be able to do something that a clinician will understand, and it needs to be able to be analyzed by a clinician. So I jumped back on the, near, the, the first plane back to the lab, <laughs> and uh, go over there, back to, back to Sutton, where I sat, sat at my desk for a while, and I thought, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make this easier? So I was weighing up the <coughs> kinetic modeling against uh, some other method. So what could we do that's easier? And, and it's clear to me now that because you've got this signal that's dying away, you're actually trapping an area under the graph in both cases. So what if you were to just measure how big the area was under the graph and see what the difference was before and after treatment? And so that's exactly what we did. And we looked at the maths of this, and so this is a, the correct way of writing what's the area <coughs> under the graph uh, for lactate and for pyruvate. And when you go through all the maths and you simplify all these things out, you end up with this really nice relationship between the thing that we're interested in in the kinetic modeling and the thing that we can get by coloring in under the graph. 
And so I was thinking, great, maybe this is something the clinicians will like. So, um, so I, and, and the way that we uh, check if this works is by plotting all of, I plotted all my experimental data. And you can see here, you've got your K from the kinetic modeling and you've got your lactate divided by pyruvate signals. And there's a really, really nice correlation between the two of them. And this was exciting for us. We thought, this means that you can, you can bypass the kinetic modeling if you want to, and you can just plot the area ratios, and you get something that gives you the same sensitivity of, of detecting treatment response. And this was something I was hoping maybe I'd get a better result from the, a better response from the clinicians about. So I, I put this uh, abstract in for another conference in Philadelphia. So I shot back over in the plane. And for those of you who know, Philadelphia is the land of Rocky. And uh, I was hoping I wouldn't come into too many confrontations uh, while I was there, especially with clinicians. But I was, I was ready, had the Eye of the Tiger going on on my MP3 player. And so I, I, I went to this uh, lecture and I had an oral presentation. So I was looking out and thinking, right, there's got to be some clinicians out there. And I spotted one. And, uh, and I put forward this area under the curve ratio. And I was very, very happy when his response was slightly different to the previous one. And we thought, great, we're getting somewhere. This is awesome. So uh, we then wrote up the work. And I was really happy to have it published. So hopefully now around the place, there are other clinicians having similar responses and other scientists having similar responses to this analysis method, which is a simpler method and should be, should be really useful in the clinic. So that's, that's kind of my major part in, uh, in what we've done. Um, but I want to tell you now about how the DMP field as a whole has improved in terms of clinical applications. Um, and coming back to the kind of motivation for this was, the, um, was this SDG PET study. So we were after something that gave this kind of information but without, without using radiation. And we've got these people to thank for, for, this, uh, for this work. So this is John Kahanovitz, Dan Vineron, and Sarah Nelson. And they're all professors in, in the UCSF um, Institute in San Francisco. And I was uh, really lucky to have the chance to spend six months of my PhD there while, while they were doing the very first clinical trial of DMP. It was a, and it was a really exciting uh, place to be. And so I'm going to show you a couple of their results. So if you remember from earlier, I said, I showed you this picture of the, the prostate cancer. Um, can anyone point out where the tumor is? Great. Where the red arrows are, right? Excellent. That's what I was hoping you'd say. So we use DMP to see, uh, we put this, this grid over to get the, um, to acquire the spectrum. And this is what we saw from, the, from these uh, points on the graph, on the, uh, on the image. And when you actually draw them as like a heat map, not only do we see a region here where we know the tumor is, we see another region over here, which is really, really interesting. If you can compare that, I mean, I don't know, I, I've looked at this image quite a lot, and I can't see anything here. I know it's not the highest quality, but I can't see any evidence of a tumor here. Whereas the DMP says something really different. And this was, this was really exciting for the DMP field. And, and this person actually had a biopsy uh, taken of the tissue here and the tissue here. Now, biopsy is where you kind of remove a little bit of the tissue. It gets sent off to the lab, and they analyze it to see whether it's normal or cancerous. And it was proven that this area was actually cancerous as well. So DMP has not only found this bit, but it's also shown that this guy had another area that we needed to be aware of. And so this is, this is exciting progress in the field. And so because of how, how uh, good this research has been, there's been a lot of um, developments in the, in the way of DMP's clinical applications. And they've got this now dedicated um, spin lab, which is, looks slightly different to the, the hypersense I showed you earlier. and also means that people have less far to run because you can actually put them right next to the scanners, which is great. Um, so overall, I'm going to sort of wrap up there and say that uh, hopefully you've seen where my, my work sort of fitted in into the overall field of DMP. Um, and if, if there's anything important uh, that I'd like you to take away is if you see a, a physicist running in a corridor, maybe you'll first of all step aside, let them run past, maybe cheer them on, unless they look like this, in which case you should run after them and try and keep up, I think. So... Um, with that, I'll say thank you very much to, um, first of all, to my supervisors, who are these three, Tom, Ewan, Lee, and Martin, 
um, than people that have been directly related to, to the work, especially Neil for helping me out a lot with this presentation as well. Um, but it's not just the people that you, that you work with, it's all of the other people that make a big difference to, to your experiences as well and keep you going. So thank you to all of them as well. And also thank you all for turning up and for listening to me for the last 40 minutes. So I'll stop there and happily take any questions. So in the unless you eat lots of broccoli, right? yeah, yeah, we don't force feed patients broccoli before. Mm. Um, so in the in the clinical experiments, the free radical is completely <coughs> removed from. Uh, so it goes through a, a column and is removed <coughs> from the solution before it's injected. Oh, I see. Okay. And there's actually some really neat um, advancements in that. You <coughs> instead of um, this was something that was in the conference recently. Instead of having like mixing the radical in uh, the liquid, they have the radical trapped in like a silicon matrix, <coughs> which is which is really absorbent, uh, absorbent. So you can squeeze your sugar onto this matrix. The polarization happens, and then all you need to do is just wash it out, and the, the radical is actually trapped in that matrix. So I don't know if there's a nicer way of doing it. dies away, it's, so it's called the, the T1, uh, which characterizes this exponential decay of your, um, of your signal. That's about one minute, so that means that you have about three minutes or so to actually acquire the data. So, so you yeah. Like yeah, yeah. So you, uh, that's why it's so important to do things so quickly. But with the, the spin lab, it's better, like they have a, a better system of removing the radical and getting it from the solid into the liquid where you can inject it is a lot quicker now. So the, the results that I was showing there is actually on the, the very first system that was made and it took about 40 seconds to get from uh, the dissolution to injection and they've, they've reduced that down now I think to about 20. So it's, um, it's getting better. You could give them, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't give it to them while they were lying on the bed. But um, you essentially um, you would need to like the practical side of it would be get the data off and analyze it and give it back. Um, we're talking so changes in tumor volume can take weeks to occur, and changes in metabolism can happen within 24 hours or less. So you're talking about finding a response to treatment a lot earlier than looking for a change in volume and I, I showed an example where change in volume wasn't wasn't an appropriate way of determining treatment response as well. 
So it's, it's good in that, that regard too. Yeah, that's a really good good point. So in the example I showed, it was that was the way they had set up the acquisition. But you can um, you can acquire data over the whole region. Um, I think what what's more likely to happen is at, uh, in the first instance, anyways, people often have um, have a diagnosis beforehand, and you know where the tumor is likely to be. In this case, I uh, I think we were kind of they were lucky, but um, that this person would have uh, would have they would have found that. Tumor using something else, I think, but uh, but yeah, you can put a grid over the whole the whole area. It's just a case of playing with the signal and trying not to lose too much of it within that time. Another question: How fast is the, the scan? I mean, you've only got a couple of minutes mm. to do the. You've only got a couple of minutes of, of, of lifetime of, of, uh, yeah. of, the, of the hyperpolarized species. How long does it take to do an MRI scan? So when you say, for example, the, um, <coughs> the example I showed, the, the most simple sequence we could use, which is the pulse acquire, so we, we weren't localising, we were just acquiring over the whole region. And there, the, the spectroscopy sequences are really quick. So I was, re I was repeating the scan every two seconds. So I oh yeah, but the image when you do an image, yeah. Yeah, the image takes quite a lot longer. Doesn't it? Not when it's hyperpolarised. You can get away with, uh, you, you do tricks, um, so you use kind of optical fast So I think that the, the, the first thing was just wanting to, I, so I love physics, but I found that working on physics that was uh, kind of more pure physics, didn't, it didn't feel like I was getting enough of the application into, the, into people. And, and I've always been interested in the chemistry and the biology, so I kind of felt like I wanted to learn what physics was like when you applied it to a, uh, a more biological system. So that was kind of how I found the Institute of Cancer Research. but. I think actually getting this project was, um, I don't want to say it was luck, but um, I kind of, I went along, I actually went along to the interviews for a different uh, PhD, and this, this uh, project was advertised on the day I, that I was there, and it was just like, oh, by the way, we've managed to get another project in. So I kind of didn't have much time to think about it. So um, it was kind of just like, oh yeah, that sounds cool, and I went with it from there, and it's been, it's been a really rewarding area to be in. Um, and I, I wish I'd have known about it before, because I think if I'd have had longer to prepare for the interview, it would have, <laughs> it might have you know, been a bit less scary. But, um, but yeah, it was a nice, nice question. Hi, Lan. Just where, where it's going to take your next interview, and what you've got your hopes are for your next uh, Yeah, next so my, my next, um, so I'm, I'm starting a postdoc in Norway, uh, in Trondheim, on the 1st of November. So. I'm leaving in not, not very long. And um, my next project's actually going to be looking at prostate cancer. So I'm um, honing in on a specific type of cancer. Um, but actually, the group that I'm joining don't have DMP facilities, but they're interested in getting them. So I think I'm kind of going to be a bit of a sounding board for them. But I, I wanted to broaden my horizons a little bit because I feel that I've, I've learned DMP now, but I don't feel like I have that much strength in the in the kind of normal imaging side, so the kind of using other techniques to find out similar information. So I'm hoping to gain some of those uh, experience or some of that expertise over the next sort of two years or so and see see what happens next.
that stuff. And I think the link between the two was rather well thought about. But anyway, mm. I'd like you to uh, thank Debbie again. And there are tea and a, a, a wonderful selection of brand new biscuits. And I remind you. Tuesday the 12th of November, searching for Susie, and Tuesday, uh, 29th of October, I'm not sure what date that is, but <coughs> 29th of October, exploring the eighth mm. bosom. I will stick this elegant notice on the board.